Hello everyone. I welcome you to this module called Culture and Encoding. This lecture is part of your paper on media culture and society. In this lecture, we'll introduce you to classical conceptions of culture and the communications within the terrain of critical theory. The idea of classical here is informed by the major contributions not only from Marxism but also various other positions as well. But broadly we should like to put them all together because they, all inf they are informed by the same uh, undercurrents that is the conventional dogged understanding of Marxism or political economy. And now within this Marxist terrain which are, we talk about three aspects we would like to take up. One is the false consciousness, critical theory and economism and the commonality between these three trends what Lawrence Grossberg talks about that all these three suppositions seek to find a direct relation between the cultural text and the social economic realities. And that is why this lecture is titled as Cultural Encoding. Now in a conventional sense, in the classical Marxist approach, which focuses more on the encoding of the media text rather than the process of decoding. Now Grossberg argues that the classical Marxist approaches avoid any confrontation with the text by bracketing decoding processes. Such analysis focus on the relationship between the producer and the text or it says there is a direct correspondence between the producer and the text implying that consumers are passive on unaware of the ways in which messages act upon them. Now communication becomes a process of self-colonization of the individual life world. In this lecture, we will discuss the first theoretical trend of false consciousness. Grossberg refers to, to one of the seminal works by Ariel uh, Doffman and Armand Matlath and another work by Todd Chitlin within this particular framework uh, that refers to false consciousness. Therefore, we will divide the lecture into two parts. In the first part, the work of Ariel Doffman and Arnold Matlat will be discussed. The second part deals with that of Todd Jitlin's ideas. You will learn how media culture has been a site of intense contestation to the extent that the rejection of dominant cultural forms and censorship of the alternative media cultural forms have been part of the larger history of media studies. Since this lecture is about encoding, that is the production of cultural forms, you will get familiar with the movements against various kinds of uh, uh, imp cultural impositions from the West or from any part and the role of what you call the American media in framing social movements. In this background, let us now look at these two works that explain the theoretical train of false consciousness. How to read Donald Duck? How to read Donald Duck, this is actually a comics which was manufactured or made in the United States, it represents an imperialist ideology through Disney comics and that's kind of a comics which was circulated in parts of the Latin American countries. This book is about, this cartoon character is about a Donald Duck which initially was produced in the form of a comic book. Later the cartoon series was produced for television which many of you might have seen and watched. The authors present a critique of this Disney comic, the way it has been appropriated, consumed and also in a subconscious level how it affects. So this is where you find Disney comic, the American cultural imperialist ideology, the idea of production and the idea of consumption is fulfilled. That is what the author is sort of trying to say that the text, it has fulfilled the purpose of its production and also consumption. So that's where there is a direct linkage without questioning that idea of production itself. So that is what it sort of says that text even gives you a false consciousness 
and that is where the producer of the text and he dropping that text elsewhere the purpose of consuming that text itself is fulfilled and that is where this is an interesting example which has been studied how a little child in through the subconscious lang uh, um, um, language an alien to a culture in terms of alien society in Chile sort of trying to uh, utter in subconscious level talking about bang 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 in terms of bringing out the gun from the holster and acting and imitating like a Donald Duck and that is what uh, sort of uh, talked about uh, by these scholars and referred that, that, that how that, that particular text has provided or created a sense of a false consciousness and this is what and uh, this I, I should hence we should be reading their work in the light of the practical need that inspired them to write this book how to read Donald Duck and this was actually written this was actually written at the time of the political struggle to free the South American or Latin American country Chile from dependency on North America or what is commonly referred as United States this book can be considered as one of the classics to address media culture in the context of third world countries. The authors state it is no accident that the first thoroughgoing analysis of Disney ideology should come from one of the most economically and culturally dependent colonies of the US empire. The book was written at the time of Chilean revolutionary struggle in 1971. It was the time when under the democratic government of Salvador Allende Gossens, Chile was undergoing revolutionary transformation. The authors state that Chile was like a colony of US till 1970. The Chilean people were fighting for their independence from United States and criticizing the mass cultural commodities exported and dumped by United States as an integral part of their this fight uh, I mean that was against the fight against this imposition the content of the comics was full of instances feeding into the psychology of Chilean children not to question the cultural and economic dependence of their country on US and rebel and in a way their conclusion was upheld when the general Pinochet who overthrew Allende's government gained support by appealing to many of the values and cultural images imbued in the Disney text. Chile is a Latin American country to understand the arguments of the authors it is essential for you to know that many Latin American countries such as Chile, Venezuela, Cuba have registered American imperialist domination on their workers, culture and natural resources. One should locate this book within that revolutionary and counter-revolutionary context. You'll be surprised to know that the book exposed the cultural hegemony of America in such a way that it was banned during the military dictatorship in 1973 and was subject to burning. But the authors say in their book that this should not come as a surprise as there were many other books that were destroyed, prohibited and censored. The right to be found in possession of a copy was to risk one's life by cleansing Chile of every trace of Marxist or popular art and literature. The junta protected the cultural envoys of their imperial masters. They knew what kind of culture best served their interests. That Mickey and Donald helped keep them in power, held socialism at bay. 
On September 11, 1973, the U.S. aided the horrific counter-revolution in Chile. Those supporting the democratically elected government were executed. All the cultural symbols representing the spirit of democracy were demolished, such as murals. Murals were a site of cultural resistance for the people of Chile. There were public bonfires of books, posters and comics. It is an open fact that American provided the support for overthrowing the constitutional government of Chile through a coup and bringing the military dictatorship to ensure its control over the resources of Chile. In the words of Matla and Dorfman, to realize their objective, an invisible blockade was imposed. Credits were denied. Spare parts purchased for industrial machinery were not sent. And later, the Chilean state bank accounts in the US were blocked and an embargo preventing the sale of the Chilean copper throughout the world was organized. There were, however, two items which were not blocked, that is planes, tanks, ships and technical assistance for the Chilean armed forces, and magazines, TV serials, advertising and public opinion polls for the Chilean mass media. Each day, with expert United States advice in each newspaper, each weekly, each monthly magazine, each news, dispatch each movie and each comic book the arsenal of psychological warfare was fortified in the words of general pinochet the point was to conquer the minds but the people of chile registered this conquering of the minds the popular chilean cultural offensive which accompanied the social and economic liberation took multiple forms, wall paintings, popular papers, TV programs, motion pictures, theater, songs, literature. One of the most important arm of this offensive was Quimantu, the state of publishing house. Quimantu is a word from the language of the native Chilean Mapuche, which means sunshine of knowledge. It published almost 5 million books in a short span of two years, which is twice the amount which had been published in Chile in the 70 years. It is in this context of Chile's march to cultural liberation that the book was written so you can see that culture became the site of domin domination and contestation in Chile. Their cultural contestation was so hard that the authors say it proved easier to nationalize copper than to free the mass media from US influence. This proves that the ideological conditioning is very strong and that is the reason that the ruling class wished to control it at every level. As the authors of the book say, in a society where one class controls the means of economic production, that class also controls the means of intellectual production, ideas of feelings, intuitions, in short, the very meaning of life. In the second part, we will discuss about the text called The Whole World is Watching. Now let us look at another piece of work. And this is where, in fact, the whole world is watching, that is mass media in the making and on making of New Left, is a book penned by a leading sociologist of media that is Todd Chitlin. 
This book discusses the contestations over the control of the public cultural space in a society saturated with the products of culture industry. It is a study of making and on making of a student's organization, Students for a Democratic Society in America during 1960s. It was a student organization representing a new left ideology and was formed in 1960. It was discovered by media in the year 1965 when it protested against the Vietnam War. This means that, that this SDS has been working before 1965, but media started highlighting it only when it started protesting against the Vietnam War. And with that, the media started framing SDS negatively, and Jitlin conducted framing analysis of the news coverage of SDS in CBS News and New York Times. Regarding media framing, he makes an interesting remark what makes the world beyond direct experience look natural is a media frame. Frames are central to journalism. In, in fact, its primary task is to regulate the production of frames in an organized manner. Frames are principles of selection, emphasis and presentation composed of little tacit theories about what exists what happens and what matters. Media frames are persistent patterns of cognition, interpretation and presentation, of selection, emphasis and exclusion by which symbol handlers routinely organize discourse, whether verbal or visual. Gitlin says, that in the beginning of 1960s, the media did not give much importance to this movement, but suddenly in 1965, when this particular movement organized anti-war protests, the movement was amplified. This amplification was selected. It emphasized certain themes and scanted others. Jitlin argues, that the New York Times initially framed it, this movement's activities positively, but it shipped in 1965 towards trivializing and denigrating the same movement. Now this movement was now viewed as extremist, deviant and dangerous. So the book is about how the media responded to the emergence of students' movement and at the same time, what were the consequences of media coverage of the movement in terms of its structure, its leadership, its politics, its strategy and tactics. He says that the speed and efficiency of media spreading the news have produced a new situation for social movements, where the movement has to build up strategy on how to cope up with media coverage. In such new situation, the movements feel called upon to rely on a large scale communications in order to matter, uh, in order to say who they are and what they intend to publics they want to say. George Itlin states, that it is mass media that decide the fate of the movement. Media certify leaders, it convert leaders into celebrity. In this way, mass media define the public significance of movement. Based on his case study, Jitlin argues that the media is specialized in orchestrating everyday consciousness. It has become core system for the distribution of ideology. Thus he says, that is to say, every day directly or indirectly by statement and omission in pictures and words, in entertainment and news and advertisement, the mass media produce 
fields of definition and association, symbol and rhetoric through which ideology becomes manifest and concrete. One important task for ideology is to define and also define away its opposition. This has always been true, of course. Both the omnipresence and centralization of the mass media and their integration into the dominant economic sector and the web of the state create new conditions for oppositions. He makes an interesting remark by comparing the process of making meanings in the world of commercialized culture with the process of making value in the world through labor. Just as people as workers have no voice in what they make, how they make it or how the product is distributed and used, so do people as producers of meanings have no voice in what the media make of what they say or do or in the context within which the media frame their activity. While giving central importance to ideology, he does not deny the possibility that people may reject the framings of mass media. He says that analysis of ideology should raise two questions. The first should be on how and where are the ideas produced in society. Second question that any ideological analysis should raise is that why are certain ideas accepted and rejected by people? In this context, he says that society is not a machine or a thing. It is a coexistence of human beings who do what they do, including maintaining or changing a social structure as sentiment, reasoning, moral and active beings who experience the world who are not simply caused by it. The patterned experience of the world takes place in the realm of what we call ideology. Todd Jitlin retains Gramsci's core conception that those who rule the dominant institutions secure their power in large measure directly and indirectly by impressing their definitions of the situation upon those they rule and if not usurping the whole of ideological space still significantly limiting what is thought throughout the society. In conclusion, I would like to submit here we end our discussion on both the works that exemplify the false consciousness approach for Grossberg. For more details, you may read the, both the books. Grossberg criticized both the works for negating consumption aspects and focusing only on the production, even the hermeneutics aspects, which is also being extremely neglected. He argues that their analysis of the media is based on the assumptions that people take it to be a realistic representation. He rightly pointed out that the audience may respond to the messages according to an alter alternative reading of the encoded frames. Despite the limitations of the books that we discussed, one thing is noteworthy in this approach that media culture as a site of contestation for domination and liberation emerges strongly. This is one of the significant contributions of such approach which cannot be ignored in a world where cultural imperialism is the dominating ideology. The two books under consideration comment more on the dominant ideology. These works cannot be refuted just by saying that they do not give importance to meaning making process. It is an important study of dominant ideology. Cultural forms in any society cannot be separated from its economic structure. 
the economic structure guides the codes and conventions of encoding of messages and meanings in cultural forms. This means that the production and cultural forms are inextricably linked, interlinked, we can say. In fact, if we look at the British cultural studies, it also does not deny the possibility of a dominant ideology encoded in the text. Stuart Hall gives importance to how people negotiate with media texts in their negotiations. The first possibility that Stuart Hall espouses is acceptance of the dominant ideology by people. Similarly, if you look at the works of John Thompson, who presents a holistic picture by combining the various theoretical trends of Frankfurt School, cultural studies and semiotics, thereby bringing production and consumption together also does not reject cultural dominance of mass media. He analyzes the institutional apparatus of production in detail. Hence, both the works are significant in highlighting the fact how media culture can be site of contestation. Such analysis acquires strength if it is joined with the consumption aspect. Let me conclude this lecture with the following words of Stuart Hall, who is credited with propounding the theory of decoding. He aptly summarizes the significance of encoding. There is no necessary correspondence between encoding and decoding. The former can attempt to prefer but cannot prescribe or guarantee the latter, which has its own conditions of existence. Unless they are wildly aberrant, encoding will have the effect of constructing some of the limits and parameters within which decodings will operate. If there were no limits, audience could simply read whatever they liked into any message. No doubt, total misunderstandings of this kind do exist, but the vast range must contain some degree of reciprocity between encoding and decoding moments. Otherwise, we cannot speak of an effective communicative exchange at all. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. For more details, please read the modules carefully and attempt the questions given at the end of each module. Thank you.